Uh, welcome, I'm Dr. Mochabo Mohar, co-organizer of the Mobility Roundtable based at the Scape and Zyre Research Institute, my sign here at Harvard Medical School. I will be uh, introducing and uh, then my co-organizer, Dr. Andrew uh, Tomlinson from the University of Leeds in the UK, uh, will introduce the speaker and guide the Q&A. Andrew. Okay, thank you. Thank you much, Deba. So uh, today's topic, mobility and the road to automated vehicles, a new highway or a, or a dead end. And cars that drive themselves have been a science fiction dream for many years, the ultimate expression of personal freedom. In fact, your own carriage to take you wherever you want to go. And it seems in recent years, this is the, the dream has started to become a reality with vehicle manufacturers introducing increasingly sophisticated uh, driver support systems. And in some cases, their vehicles giving the impression perhaps of fully autonomous driving. The justification and motivation for the development of these automated vehicles has largely been focused on their potential safety benefits, the reduction in risk of crashes caused by human error. But they can also provide a capacity boost for crowded highways and release the driver from the mundane job of driving to give them time for more productive tasks whilst they travel. So really, what's not to like? Today we have three speakers sitting at the round table, Professor Glenn Lyons and Drs Tyron Liu and Louise Dennis, and they will help us answer that question. They all have a particular interest in today's topic and will, I am sure, both enlighten us and leave us with some further questions and issues to think about. So first, firstly today, we're going to hear from uh, Glenn Lyons, who is the Mott MacDonald Professor of Future Mobility at the University of the West of England. Glenn has written extensively on transportation topics, including the introduction of automated vehicles, and last year hosted a series of workshops that brought together proponents and opponents of the technology together with the aim of achieving some kind of automated vehicle consensus. So uh, without further ado, uh, ado uh, it's over to you then, Glenn. Thanks very much indeed, Andrew, and uh, good afternoon or evening or morning indeed, depending on where you are in the world right now. I'm really pleased to, to be part of this roundtable discussion. Um, and I'll declare straight away that my introductory remarks will not answer this question. In fact, you may even think I'm sitting on the fence by the time I've finished um, my remarks. But uh, Andrew's hinted at why that, will, that might, might be, because uh, I'm interested in, in these lovers and haters, as I call them, uh, and how we get them to, to work together. Um, I realised recently that um, when I did my PhD over a quarter of a century ago, it was focused on artificial neural networks and driver behaviour. And to start with, I couldn't understand why one of my papers was suddenly getting new citations. Uh, and then the penny dropped. I was actually a pioneer in the autonomous vehicles movement, and I just hadn't realised it. Um, although I must quickly confess, um, since then, my career really has focused much more on making sense of what I'd see as the socio-technical system we all live in. Uh, so I'm much more a planner than a technologist, just to get that clear. Um, my research is really centered upon how the digital age has collided and merged with the motor age and the implications for mobility and society. And I've also specialized in uh, understanding how to handle uncertainty about the future, which is something, of course, very pertinent to to AVs. I really love the, the question um, that, that titles this session, um, but I do think it has two different connotations. One is, will it be a new highway? And the second is, should it be a new highway? Of course. Um, I think you'll all be aware some people speak with more conviction than others when it comes to predictions. Uh, and I have to say very clearly, I for one favour the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, who said, and I quote, not that necessarily this is what he said exactly, those who have knowledge don't predict and those who predict don't have knowledge uh, and I'm hoping you will be left thinking I have some knowledge to share. Um, what I will say however, and Andrew's touched upon it, is that there are very evidently lovers and haters when it comes to automated vehicles, especially if we're talking about driverless cars. And so at the beginning of last year, I was getting really frustrated by a sense that the lovers and haters weren't really engaging with each other, at least not constructively. The lovers were busy in their R&D programs trying to deliver AVs and talking to each other at their conferences, and the haters were scratching their heads, perplexed and shaking their heads indeed, at their conferences. And I wanted to bring them together. So I developed this initiative I called the Driverless Cars Emulsion, 
uh, and I see uh, that mysterious gentleman Paul Fermin uh, is with us uh, and is one of our participants so he may have something more to say um, and it was really an attempt to bring the oil and water viewpoints on driverless cars together uh, and as you know oil and water don't mix so my efforts were to be the emulsifier uh, and create this emulsion of shared thinking uh, on the topic and I have to say uh, the initiative went rather well um, we had a series of workshops around the UK and what I did was get participants to start with the supposition that driverless cars would be a mainstream feature of mobility in 2050. I then gave them the chance to explore plausible utopia and plausible dystopia for that 2050 horizon. Having done that, they considered the obstacles, risks and opportunities that lay between the present and getting to those future scenarios. Um, and that gave rise to a set of principles that were drawn up about how we can try and steer the course towards utopia and avoid dystopia. So what did we learn from the initiative? Uh, well, first of all, people holding different perspectives, maybe it's not a surprise to you, but you see some, some discussions and you wonder, people can learn from each other if they're prepared to listen and I think if they're provided with a safe and constructive environment where it's not about winning or losing, it's about that shared understanding developing. And as a result, we discovered people can really change their views in the course of a day's workshop. People generally acknowledge that they'd underestimated how many complicated issues needed to be addressed to progress towards any given driverless cars future. And what they found was that they better appreciated after the workshop how driverless cars form a much part of a much wider and complex mobility picture. Uh, and this acknowledgement, I think, helps explain why by the end of the workshop, and this may be where I'm coming off the fence on behalf of the 100 plus participants we had, over twice as many of our participants had become more negative than had become more positive about the core proposition of the workshops, which was driverless cars are a great opportunity for society. And by moving beyond the hype to a deeper examination of transport and society, um, the introduction of driverless cars into that setting, what that revealed was really the challenges of delivering positive outcomes um, are greater than we might otherwise suppose. After all, we are dealing with a wicked problem here. And we came up, as I mentioned, with 10 principles intended to guide present day developments with autonomous vehicles so that we can help try and ensure we move towards positive future outcomes. I won't list all of them, but just to give you a taste of some of them. Uh, first of all, perhaps primarily uh, a principal need for a strong governance framework coupled with sufficient regulation to help shape that AV future. The safety of all road users, not just those in the vehicles, should be demonstrably improved if this is to be worthwhile. Driverless cars should positively contribute to a future where walking, cycling and public transport are priorities, especially in urban areas. Um, it's being invited into this mobility system we have with other needs. Driverless cars should be designed, priced and introduced to support rather than detract from greater social inclusion. And that's far more complicated than the simple notion that anyone can get in a driverless car uh, and be mobile. Through design and operation, they should significantly contribute to air quality and reducing carbon emissions. What could be a more frightening and urgent imperative for us right now? Um, they should be space conscious, again easier said than done, uh, operating within the mobility system in a way that maximises use of in-vehicle space and minimises road and street space taken by vehicles. Now while we were exploring the future of driverless cars, it became strongly apparent that inescapably we we're actually exploring many of the key issues pertinent to the mobility system as a whole. And there are some very significant existing problems in that system that need addressing and which we must not risk exacerbating with driverless cars. Not least, of course, is the existential threat of climate change and the part that must now be played by transport to bring about what really has to be systemic change. But here is the overall rub coming back perhaps to the debating questions. Participants were able to acknowledge how driverless cars could improve mobility. But, and it's a very big but, the work to be done to meet the principles we set out 
is challenging to say the least, especially in a resource constrained environment. And to address them all effectively will require a new strength of public sector governance. And here I would really underline, underline the next bit that surpasses much to date. You know, and dare I say, look at the position in the pandemic with certain countries at the moment, and you do have to wonder just how strong our governance could be. Um, and the private sector al alone really can't deliver a fair system of services. Let's be honest about that. And therefore, the public sector has to play a strong role in supporting that change too. And uh, I have tried to stay as close to being agnostic as I can at this point, but I suspect you've picked up a couple of uh, undertones in my remarks, but uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Glenn, for kicking us off. That was a really uh, interesting uh, overview and some um, nice to hear some of the insights from the, uh, the, the uh, driverless car emulsion event that you put on last year. Um, so for moving, moving on from Glenn, uh, we're coming to our next speaker, which is a colleague of mine, Dr. Tyron Liu, who's a senior research fellow at the Institute for Transport Studies here in Leeds. So Tyron works in the field of human factors research, focusing especially on work to provide a better understanding of how humans interact with highly automated driving systems. And just incidentally, Tyron uses our a uh, full motion driving simulator in his research, which is a very safe environment for studying uh, driverless cars or automated vehicles, um, particularly when you're looking at human responses to critical driving situations. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to, uh, to Ty. Uh, am I able to share my screen? Uh, host has disabled screen sharing. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, of course, this happens right now. So while that's thinking, um, I just wanted to thank uh, you for the invite. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, what Glenn had to say, um, and I've been following the emotion work uh, and very, uh, very provocative. I think I could say I'm pretty much agnostic on the issue. I come at this very much from the driver's perspective. Uh, so I'm interested in what is safe. I'm going to give this presentation without my slideshow. I don't need this, um, not presentation, but I'll give my talk without it. Um, and hopefully by the end, you'll, you'll kind of see where I sit on, uh, on the issue. Um, you know, when I think about driverless cars, one of the things that strikes me is the furor uh, over them. Uh, and despite all the attention that they've received in the media and in universities and behind closed doors and in companies, um, we've got very little idea of, of what's going to happen in terms of the future. Uh, we've got no certainty of how it's all going to play out, but we're here meant to be preparing for that future. Um, so the unpredictability, I think, is quite extraordinary as well, especially when you consider um, the changes that are coming regarding the electrification of different transport systems, um, the greater emphasis, and rightly, the emphasis on uh, sustainable and active travel modes, um, uh, the digitization of the economy and the associated changes to uh, the future of work, and even so far as to say the shifting political and economic powers uh, globally. Um, and amongst all of this uncertainty, we have to prepare for that future. And obviously, I can't, I'm not going to speak about any of those uh, broader issues. I'm just going to say that I come at this from the driver's perspective, humbly, I think, as well. Uh, this is the person who's going to use this technology every single day. Um, and trying to get into their mindsets uh, about how it's going to affect them. Um, you know, what's extraordinary, I think, about drivers is the capacities that we know that some of them have. Rally drivers, for example, uh, and their capacities for precise motor control, hazard perception, spatial awareness, and effective communication in really high pressure situations. And they are exceptional. Uh, but they are highly trained, they are experienced and they're skilled and often they're collaborating with equally experienced co-drivers. Uh, 
And we know that this doesn't represent the average driver. Um, and that leads most people to say, well, 93% of, of all uh, crashes have some element of human error in them. So therefore, if we uh, take the human out, uh, we will get rid of all, um, all deaths uh, that are related to human errors. And uh, in, in speaking to Andrew about this, um, he said, you know, well, maybe some people might say, well, then what's the problem? Where are the human factors issues? Um, isn't that kind of the point that you're getting rid of the human so there's no human factors issues? But I don't think that it's a silver bullet because self-driving cars will not be perfect. They'll not be infallible drivers uh, and we can expect latent bugs or errors or system failures. And I've personally experienced some of these on more than one occasion. And I can tell you it is frightening when you're in that and you as someone who is a bit skeptical, who's watching every minute and every move, um, and then something goes wrong that in your wildest imagination, you couldn't have anticipated, that's really scary. So what I'm trying to get at is that by trying to blindly merge these two kind of imperfect systems, we're beginning to see issues with that new human machine relationship and kind of new types of accidents as well. And that's what I study. And over the years, we've been studying the behavior of hundreds of drivers in automation at the University of Leeds Driving Simulator. And one of the things that I focus on is visual attention. And what we find is that drivers' visual attention in automation is significantly more dispersed uh, during automated driving than in manual driving, which means that they miss safety, important safety-related cues. Um, if they're asked to resume control, and especially if there's subtle automation failures um, that come without warning, uh, some of those that I experienced. And what's more, we know we've seen on a number of occasions that drivers will crash even if they're in control and even if they're looking at the threat. This is because drivers need time to get back into the loop, both cognitively and physically. Uh, you know, and our research shows it's also not about how quickly someone is resuming control. It's about how well they understand that system and how early they can mitigate those risks. You know, we've seen a number of videos of drivers falling asleep behind the wheel of these um, autopilots or semi-autonomous or uh, driverless cars and tricking the driver engagement sensors with water bottles and oranges. And what this tells us is that some drivers will take a chance. They will exploit a system for their own purpose as long as the design of that system allows it. And as we can see, we now have cars on the road that let drivers fall asleep behind the wheel that can be operated in areas and on roads that it wasn't designed to be operated on. And that intentionally given names by manufacturers that inflate expectations. And I really think that this isn't good enough because the result is that we're creating situations where drivers are not guided to behave in a way that will see them benefit from the safety that automation promises or that they're being promised that automation will bring. So I think there are four things that we really should be doing about this. And, you know, they, they kind of float in at different levels. I think first our task is to educate the public. You know, some of what Glenn has spoken about is, is doing exactly that. And the responsibility comes uh, as, you know, friends, as lawmakers, as media, uh, as public institutions. We need to educate the public about and, and be honest about where we are with this technology. We really need to investigate what the users of these systems are capable of understanding and of doing and in what context and as that technology evolves and how this varies across a diverse population, not only within um, in, in Middle England, but also in South Africa or in Colombia or in China. Um, and our task is to use this information carefully to design for drivers to develop appropriate levels of trust or reliance in them and to form accurate mental models of how these systems behave. You know, we need to have automation that observes and assesses the driver in the same way that we expect drivers to supervise the automation. Think of that uh, example of the rally driver that we gave. Uh, there is that collaboration that we, you know, we just expect that will happen. We need to have that same expectation when it comes to automation. And we need to have commonality in the way that the systems behave and the information that they provide and how it's presented. Uh, and we should try avoid letting these really important safety related 
design features be the playground of the vehicle manufacturers as they seek to differentiate themselves. And that's on, uh, as, uh, as, Glenn, uh, as Glenn said, a governance issue. You know, there's, there's standardization issues that come into play and I really hope the lawmakers will take that, will take that point seriously. And finally, I think our task, more, more generally, our task is to reflect on whether we need or should have a particular system or a particular level if you care about levels um, of automation in the first place. And I say that because if our goal is safety, if our main goal is safety here, then perhaps we should be talking about promoting active safety systems rather than automation for the sake of automation. And I just wanna end on this really lovely quote that I came across, I think while I was doing my PhD by Paris, Sheridan and Paris Rimmer in one of their papers, which, which goes, you know, to the extent that a system is made less vulnerable to operator error, it's made more vulnerable to designer error. And given that the designer is also human, this simply displaces the locus of human error. And in the end, automation is really human after all. So I'm probably right where Glenn is on this. Uh, I have the driver at heart, uh, I have safety at heart, um, and I'm sure that we'll have a wonderful conversation and some really interesting questions, but um, that's my bit. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Tyron. That was, uh, that was really uh, a passionate um, exposition of your uh, position. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so our third speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Louise Dennis, a senior lecturer and researcher from the University of Manchester. Um, and it says in her profile that her research interest falls at the intersection of artificial intelligence and computational proof. And she has most recently focused on issues around programming and ver verification of autonomous systems. So why, so Louise has got a really different background from both uh, Glenn and Ty and generally most of the people that we have in these uh, mobility uh, round tables. But she's a great person to be, to, to have at this round table today because she can provide some um, insight into the difficult technical challenges associated with showing that the software that drives the AVs when, they, uh, when, they're, when they're being uh, driven autonomously will work reliably and safely. So it really feeds on from, uh, from what uh, Tyrone has just been saying. So I'll hand over to, to Louise now um, and she can take it further. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this round table. Um, my starting point, I'm going to talk a bit about um, regulation and governance that's already been touched on because one of the barriers certainly perceived by developers of autonomous vehicles um, is a lack of clarity about what the regulatory framework is going to be around them. Um, if you talk to regulators, I mean, so you see this throughout industry, the, the developers regard the regulator as someone who stops them doing something, whereas often the regulators view themselves as enablers. Um, they believe that by setting up the right framework and ensuring safety or ensuring reasonable safety, then that and she helps build public trust and that becomes an enabler of a, a, a technology in particular it helps um, avoid catastrophic accidents which might shut down um, um, a whole avenue of development um, when that comes um, so i don't have much experience with the regulators actually in the automotive industry i know what happens in the aerospace industry and in the nuclear industry where they take quite different approaches so in the aerospace industry, particularly for the software in aircraft, they have very high standards of what we call formal verification. So that's where you come up with a mathematical statement of what the software is supposed to do. And then you use mathematical proof. And there's a variety of ways to do that to ensure that the software um, meets that mathematically stated property. And this is required as a standard throughout the throughout the development process of any software that's going to go into a, an aircraft that is going to fly in UK airspace and 
most other airspaces too. Um, in the nuclear industry, they take a very different approach and that is generally because they don't believe they can say there's a standard where you should do something. Every problem that arises is unique and has to have its own solution. So they have much more of a process built around creating safety cases, which are generally sort of structured documents which put forward an argument about why this particular thing you're proposing to do is going to be safe in that context. What both industries and the automotive industries are facing as an issue is this concept of autonomy. They've all had software doing things before now. There is software in your car, running the entertainment system, running a whole load of diagnostic systems. So it's not unusual to have software, but something about autonomy, some level at which these new systems are making decisions makes us feel that our existing techniques for understanding what they're going to do and ensuring safety are inadequate. And it becomes very difficult because you get into trying to define what you mean by autonomy, what's special about these particular sorts of decisions that makes them different from the kinds of decisions the software was already making. And I don't have a solution to that, um, but all these industries are looking at this as an issue. Um, and one of the big problems is these kind of deep neural net machine learning systems that are driving a lot of the development here. We do not have good techniques for analyzing these systems and understanding what they can do. So for instance, if I take a vision system, as I said, for formal verification, we needed a mathematical statement of what the software should do. I cannot mathematically tell you recognize a human or even recognize a large animal. We, we don't have a mathematical statement of what that is. So we've already got a problem in simply defining what that system's supposed to do. Let alone when you have a neural network, um, this is a whole load of individual components which have thresholds. So you put your pixels of your image in at one end, each individual pixel, and then these components, some of them will say yes, some of them will say no, and it goes through to the next layer, and at that layer, some bits say yes, some bits say no. And there's kind of statistical threshold at each layer, how this propagates through. It's very difficult to, to really analyze that and understand what it's doing, even if you have a formal statement of what it's supposed to do correctly. So that's been a big problem. Now, this is actually a really rapidly advancing area. So what people are beginning to move towards is although they can't say mathematically what it is to recognize a human being, they can begin to say um, mathematical notions of stability. So um, not many years ago, uh, a team at Oxford um, were able to show that by changing a few pixels in an image, you could radically change the outcome of one of these vision recognition systems. And in fact, the example they used was traffic lights. And they could show that by altering a handful of pixels, you could get the system to classify a red traffic light as a green traffic light. And this is a mistake that a human wouldn't make. Um, so they, we now have mathematical definitions of stability, which are about how much you should be able to alter an image to get a different classification. So although that's not a, the sort of thing we'd really like, you know, what is it to be a human, at least we have some idea that if you've done some testing around this system, someone can't just flip a few pixels and change that. And so then that gives you a standard that you might be able to say you need to put in your car. So we're working towards some things and there's also a whole load of techniques which I actually only discovered last week and now being called neurosymbolic artificial intelligence, whereas I've been calling them hybrid methods for years. <laughs> but neurosymbolic sounds a lot more exciting. Um, and that's where you have your statistical model embedded within much more traditional software. Um, there's also a whole load of stuff Tyron can better talk about. Even if you've got the software um, specified properly and verified properly, you've got a whole load of human factors, which again, it's difficult for us to specify and you want to consider in your regulation. 
And then we get into things like ethics. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of trolley problems. They're hugely popular. They're okay. Suddenly the car is driving on the street and there's, I don't know, a nun on the left and a pram on the right. And which do you run over? Because you're going to have to run over one of them. A lot of people in the space think these are distractors in a way. You very, very rarely have to solve those sorts of problems. But nevertheless, we ought to be asking what does it mean for a system to drive with due care and attention? What does it mean to be aware that there might be a danger ahead? So you might slow down below the speed limit, which is what you're legally required to be below, because you anticipate that there might be a danger coming up. And trolley problems can help with what that means as long as we understand that risk and uncertainty plays a big part in this sort of reasoning which the traditional trolley problems tend not to to take account for but then you also have a really genuine ethical problem which is should government have some role or regulation in saying who gets to live and who gets to die and actually the german constitution has some quite strong opinions about how these sorts of things cannot be decided in advance and that leaves us with some actually quite thorny problems in terms of how you develop these systems. If you believe that hum all human life is sufficiently unique, that you should not have any kind of algorithm that in advance decides who lives and who dies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. That was another very interesting uh, uh, viewpoint on the, on the subject. So we've had really three really uh, good uh, presentations there. Um, maybe if I, if I just start the ball rolling with a, with a question, so um, perhaps this, this could probably apply to, it could be asked to all of you, but perhaps to Ty and Louise in the first uh, instance. So you, you both kind of mentioned um, aerospace. Uh, do you think perhaps the approach, the introduction of automated fly-by-wire systems uh, in the airline industry that we can follow a same mod a similar model in terms of the introduction of uh, aut autonomous vehicles it seems to me that as we uh, introduced fly by wire uh, essentially the systems became safe as a result of the crashes that that occurred because each crash that occurred kind of found the problems in the software that Tyron was suggesting that the, that the the human error comes in the design rather than in the in the operation so isn't it and, I, and I'm being kind of devil's advocate here but isn't it a matter of just kind of putting the software out there uh, getting the vehicles to drive around unfortunately we have a few crashes but as a result of those we create a safer system um, overall uh, I'm just being deliberately contentious but uh, would you would you like to go first, uh, Ty? Perhaps on on that. Well, um, I I think that people in retrospect would probably accept that that was the reality for 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 aerospace. But I think a lot of people would um, their stomachs would turn if they said that that's the approach that by design we were following uh, to improve automation. I mean the the crash. The crash that happened where Elaine Hertzberger died, uh, the Uber crash, and that's been in the news recently, that is having exactly that effect, right? Um, people, uh, cars were pulled off the road, uh, companies were a little bit careful, companies stopped um, uh, pushing out what they were going to be calling level three systems. They were much more careful about uh, the names that they were calling uh, um, some of their systems. Um, I know that Nissan, for example, had a massive overhaul with um, the names of one of their systems just because um, it potentially led to uh, some confusion. So it will have that effect. I'm not sure that anyone would accept that um, kind of going forward and saying this is the way that we're going to solve this problem. Um, but maybe that's just the academic in me wanting it to be a little bit too um, uh, rigorous and I also think that car companies are would be too scared of that they have a lot to lose in my opinion um, maybe not some of the startups um, uh, where they have a, a group of um, of enthusiasts if you want or lovers as, as Greg would maybe say uh, those early adopters of technology uh, beta testers who would be happy to take those risks but there, there are many car companies whose entire um, futures hang on getting this right and um, we saw what reputational damage that that did to some of the manufacturers uh, that have already been in that situation so um, 
yeah, that's that's probably all I all I want to say on that right now. Thanks. And uh, Louise, you mentioned like the aerospace uses formal verification and uh, nuclear uses a kind of bespoke safety case approach. So where would where would the automate autom autonomous vehicles fit within that kind of spectrum? Do you, um, do you think? I'm going, I'm going to, I'll start with um, the aerospace industry and the nuclear industry are hugely risk averse in a way that the automotive industry is not. Um, and there's a very complex history and psychology of risk that feeds into to why that is the case. Um, so people have found some horrendous, I mean, people have been able to hack into car software via the entertainment system and rewrite the operating system. So, and that would be very, I mean, I'm not gonna say it would be impossible in aircraft software, but they've done a lot of work to try and make sure that can't happen. Whereas people I know in security feel that the automotive industry hasn't even done the basic 101 stuff um, in terms of software verification. So, I mean, I was having conversations with the people in the aerospace industry five years ago where they were saying, all these people in automotive are cowboys. Um, the moment one of their cars kills somebody, the entire industry will be shut down. And I'm gonna disagree with Tyron a bit. The Tesla crash happened. Tesla put out a publicity statement, which basically said, oh, well, he was reading Harry Potter, so it was his fault. And everyone carried on. I mean, the people I knew were flabbergasted. And I think it's come back to roost a bit more now, but that first death hardly caused a hiccup in terms of the development process. Um, and that is because I think as a society, we are much more tolerant of risk around cars than we are around um, aircraft. I mean, nuclear is a whole, whole other thing because, because the, the catastrophic failure in nuclear is, is orders of magnitude worse than it is in, in aircraft and, and, and vehicle. So um, I think we are pursuing that route. I, I actually think we are doing the let's kill a few people and we'll make it better. Should we be doing that? I mean, we, we do have tools to hand, which although they're difficult to apply and we don't have all the answers, there's already stuff we know how to do that's not happening in automotive. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think to an extent we, we are doing that. Let's just try it out and see. I think there are better ways to do it which don't involve shutting the industry down. Thank you. Do you want to come in, uh, Glenn, at all? Yeah, I, I'm I kind of kind of brimming with what what shall I say what, what can I add in um, and of course I think we all know that there'll never be enough time in this session but um, I mean as, as a quick aside fantastic study by Rand looking at very purely objectively um, is it better to wait till it's perfect or is it better to kill a few people along the way in terms of overall lives saved uh, and they conclude you know break a few eggs to make the omelette but of course that's not politically palatable um, or socially palatable uh, and I possibly challenge Louise's comment that she just made because if you if you subscribe to Gartner's hype cycle then Elaine Hertzberg's death uh, neatly maps onto the passing of the peak of inflated expectation and we're on our merry way um, down towards the trough of disillusionment because we realised just how difficult, um, you know, we've oversold the hype. It's a lovely phrase called pump, pump and dump coming from Silicon Valley, I've now learnt, which is where you um, use venture capital to fuel the hype to get valuations high and then you dump your stock before it crashes with the slump down into the trough of disillusionment. So, you know, the socio-economic and socio-political stuff going on in the background. But I think what really struck me um, listening to, to Tyron and Louise, um, particularly with Tyron's introduction, was the difficulty with this conversation is that we're, we're in different problem spaces. If your problem space is how can you invent um, a sufficiently usable driverless vehicle, 
um, then there's a huge number of in, you know complex intellectual challenges to that and there may be some really valuable spillover benefits and I think we're seeing some of those anyway in terms of driver assistance and perhaps spillovers into other sectors but if you start as I suppose I do in a different problem space um, and I'm going to refer to Gillian Annabelle's wonderful paper which she called rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic in fact she didn't she called it rearranging the elephants on the Titanic um, and if you take a problem perspective from society rather than from the survival of the automotive sector um, then the problems we face which we should be asking first what are the problems to solve are we have to decarbonize unless you're a climate change denier and to decarbonize at the pace we need, need to require systemic change we can't wait around for driverless cars to be good or bad that change in urban environments especially has to happen now if our problems in equity if it's public health if it's economy and of course safety um, then you step back and say well my problem space needs to understand those wicked problems and how i have different options for solutions and the question then is are automated vehicles really the top of the list um, or really was the automotive sector lobbying and seducing governments who are desperate to maintain economic uh, prominence to start the, the machinery working of the R&D programs the conferences are filled with papers about the solution space and I'm, I'm not being disparaging at all of, of, the, of the scientific work in that in those problem spaces but really and honestly stepping back to look at the societal problems um, I'm curious to, to, to understand and be sufficiently persuaded that autonomous vehicles especially driverless cars are front and center of how we get ourselves out of the awful mess that we're in I'm sorry I've <laughs> I've got something off my chest there, as you've detected, but I'll hand back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Glenn. That's that's a really uh, interesting point. Do you, I saw you um, kind of nodding, Ty. Do you want to come in on that? At all? Yeah, I, I can't express how much I agree with Glenn on that. And just because I just because I'm doing work on driver behavior and human factors and automated vehicles um, does not mean I necessarily agree with them. I mean, for the, for the past I think probably seven years now at conferences I've been standing up and saying this 93% uh, statistic that everyone claims is a reason why we should have automated vehicles and why we justify our position in this research space is actually the, the same, um, I guess, uh, reason why I'm slightly becoming disillusioned because I'm realizing that these companies are not doing it for the reasons that the marketing uh, sides of the, of the companies are are uh, putting out and I remember back in 2013 looking at the very first Google car before it was Waymo and before it was Alphabet or whatever it is now um, and I looked and on the outside of that Prius they had all these cameras looking outside at the world and then I saw a photo of the inside of this of this uh, cab and I was like you know what they're not really doing this for the driver they're not doing it for safety and only now we have starting to have discussions about, um, you know, driver monitoring systems in vehicles that are detecting uh, whether drivers are capable of interacting with these very complex cars um, safely. And so, uh, and, and we're having to fight really hard um, to get it noticed at conferences and in these big European projects where we're working with OEMs. Um, and some of them are, you know, they, they're realizing that it, it is an issue um, but I'm not convinced that it is the the core reason that they're doing it. Um, so, so, yes, I agree with you, Glenn. I before uh, sorry before you ask this, if if any of the audience have any question, please uh, write it in the chat box, and we'll try to get back to them. Sorry, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I maybe uh, if if I can just come back, uh, uh, Tyron. Um, I was listening to somebody last week from Volvo and they are now talking about all their systems. They, they, they call them driver assistance systems rather than ride assistance. So the focus for them is, is, is moving back towards the driver, making, making, keeping the driver front and center in the, in the process, which, which presumably is a, it's a good thing. Uh, it's the sensible thing um, because they, I think they realize how hard level four is, how hard these really high levels of automation are. And that actually when you're designing a system that is, 
it's just a good driver assistance system. That's something quite different to a car that can drive itself independently, you know, without without ever really needing the driver to come back into the loop and behave. And that's because there's in the last sort of uh, six to 10 years, there's been a lot of research showing that in this trough between level two and level four, where you have level three, um, you really can't expect drivers to be uh, to be in that position. It's just not fair. Whether whether you train them or whether you beep them or alert them or whatever is the case, we did not evolve to be in that position. So now I see, um, e even though I'm you know working in level L3 pilots in this big European project, I see the manufacturers parting the ways and focusing either on systems that are assistance systems, level two, very good level two systems, that's probably what they're working towards. And then uh, these higher level of automation, probably a little bit further along, uh, further along the road. So uh, Volvo, true to its brand, I think has recognized that uh, and is probably trying to keep the driver at the center of their, their vision. Uh, and so, so yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Thank you. Um, Louise, do, do you want to come back uh, on that at all? Or maybe have you got a question for the, for the other two? Um, I might go off on a slight tangent here. I'm afraid the daughter's about to. <laughs> um, a slight tangent here, um, which sort of picks up on, on Glenn's point that there's a AI ethics as a field went through a kind of an unfortunate phase, which I think we're mostly growing out of about two years ago, where people sort of want, expected AI could solve morality. It's like, well, the AI system will tell us what we ought to do. So, yeah, and it might be, well, the AI system will tell us how to manage climate change. So all we have to do is build the right AI, and then we can go on and do our, our own thing. I think there is now a recognition that certainly our current generation of AI systems where there are inequalities and issues, they magnify them. They don't solve them. Um, so I, I don't know how internationally audiences, we had a thing recently in the UK where they tried to decide the end of school results using an algorithm because the children couldn't sit the exams. And it turned out that that algorithm was magnifying social inequality, which and it was not necessarily the algorithm's fault. It was set an impossible problem. The problem was our system. In the UK in particular, is education system is massively unequal. I, I, and I'm a, I benefited from this <laughs> myself. So I, I came up, but that doesn't mean I'm blind to the fact that it's, it's, you know. So, so that's kind of the tangent I want to go on. I think, you know, I focus on this quite specific question around verification and safety. But, you know, it's obviously incumbent on us to, to take the wider view where we're saying you're proposing to do this thing. This is how you can make it as safe as possible. But also, should you is a, a very important question. And maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. Those are those are difficult and unanswered questions. So thank you. Thank you, Louise. So would you like to come back on that, uh, Glenn? And maybe could you have a go at the, uh, the question which is in the chat as well? about whether we, if we had cooperation between developers, whether we'd make uh, better progress. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I like that question from Millie. Um, and I, it's difficult to, to not slip into sort of conspiracy thinking uh, when it comes to, you know, those sinister private sector players. Um, you know, I think there is, there's clearly, if we go back just a few years, the automotive sector in the US was almost on its knees. If it hadn't had a public sector bailout, we might have lost uh, General Motors, I think, at that time. So you've got a, a fragile industry um, and an industry that's fiercely competitive. Um, and whilst from a public perspective, I think that's you know, a very sensible question that you're posing there. Surely if we join forces, uh, we'd, we'd share knowledge, we'd get more efficient progression through um, the research and innovation. But um, I have to say I struggle to see that being the reality that the, the, the other observation I would make and I confess it's not really a scientific one but um, if I'm uh, an OEM or if I'm a Silicon Valley player outside the automotive sector um, I've got to think carefully about yes there's going to be risk with this investment in innovation but um, there are ways in which I can offset that risk um, now this is a wacky theory of mine but um, since Waymo is part of the Alphabet group 
Um, the fundamental uh, foundation of Google especially is selling access to geography. Uh, that's what Google is all about with clickbait and ads and so on. Um, now look at all of that, the billions of gigabytes of data that Waymo is collecting. If it never delivers a driverless car, my goodness, the insights it's got in terms of GIS uh, and deepening and understanding of geography. And I suspect the other OEMs are, are, quite, are similarly looking at how can we get enhanced features on our vehicles regardless of whether we ever see level five or level four for that matter, it won't be wasted R&D. But meanwhile, in the public domain, they're fueling the, the marketing and the hype because that's all part of making sure there's an enabling environment for the, for the sector as a whole to continue um, with its, broad, broadly speaking, with its existing business model. But I'm very conscious I've kind of given a one-sided view and it's a, it's a hypothesis rather than a truth. Okay, uh, thanks, Glenn. Uh, um, okay, so should we move on to the, the next? There's another question that's come up, which is whether um, if we had better cooperation between the infrastructure providers and the AV, uh, AV developers, whether that would actually um, help in that uh, you can see a lot of benefits uh, in terms of automated vehicles running on uh, motorways or, or highways in that they um that's that's a perfect seems like a perfect environment for them to, to to operate in because it's very constrained um it's very controlled it's a closed environment there's much more predictable than perhaps driving on a, on a country road so would it would it make sense um, would we make more progress if we had a kind of more collaboration between the infrastructure owners operators and the av uh, manufacturers I mean, that's not, the, that's not the vision, is it? That's, I mean, that's getting halfway there. I know in Japan, that's, that's very much a reality, getting onto motorways and stuff. Uh, it's all blocked off and, and they're working hard on that. But um, I take what you can get, I suppose. But I don't think that's the full vision of automation that everyone is being sold. Sorry, Louise, I think I cut you off there. Um, so from a sort of verification point of view, if, if you've instrumented the roads, then definitely some of your safety problems become easier to deal with. You have, you have more data coming in, so more, more chance to kind of figure out exactly what's going on. Um, obviously, you create a massive security problem, especially if you are talking, you know, diverse manufacturers, um, all trying to integrate, all trying to, to talk over Wi-Fi within this, this system. Um, so that, that doesn't exactly answer the question of, you know, should they, should they cooperate? I mean, the question of how infrastructure and um, private company interact, I mean, that holds in lots of fields. But certainly, certainly from a verification point of view, it might make the safety question a bit less thorny, but it would make the security question a lot more thorny. So a bit, bit of swings and roundabouts there. If I may, Andrew, I, I think um, if we compare the motor age first time around with the kind of recasting of the motor age first time around to, to a large extent we were co-creating the infrastructure with the vehicles and consumer demand and I think the more complex situation now is that we've already got the legacy infrastructure and we're trying to retrofit um, a new vehicle offering as well as trying to create the consumer demand for that and and it seems to me not that it's my area of specialism but if a motor manufacturer manufacturer wants to invest they're looking at a global market and that means that coming back to the question about cooperation there would need to be cooperation internationally about changes to existing infrastructure unless the vehicles are sufficiently adaptive to different environments uh, on a global scale and that's maybe a question back to to the two of you okay so do you either have a anything you want want to say we're, we're getting to the point where we're going to have to wrap up now um, so maybe do you have any uh, finishing final comments um, either Louise and Ty and then I'll hand over to Mojdaba to finish off um, maybe maybe just to answer the the question um, uh, of the can you remind me what it is it was it a highway to hell or what <laughs> 
<laughs> oh yeah, yes, yes. So the yes, a new highway or a dead end. I was going to say cul-de-sac, but we uh, we we we, fo we chose dead end. Um, so yeah, so to, yes, go to go back to the original question. What what's your your conclusion? I think that it is neither. Uh, I'm on the other thing. I, I'm, I see. I do see benefits, but I see so many challenges in, uh, at least from a human factors perspective, in in doing that. And if we can solve all of those, then um, then I'll be happy. But maybe Glenn and and Louise have have a different idea. So, uh, Louise, do you have uh, any uh, final comments? I don't think I have anything to say about these bigger issues about should we. I think that's a, a very much an open question. Given that apparently we are, I do think there are better ways and safer ways to go about doing it, which would not completely shut down the whole industry. So I, I would certainly like to say, yeah, we should be taking safety and privacy a whole lot more seriously than perhaps we are just at the moment. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Glenn? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, a great question, as we think we've all agreed. I would say your, your question reflects a wicked problem. So there actually isn't um, an answer we can give with, with confidence, and that's reflected with Louise and Tyron. Um, I, I see that it's very unlikely to my mind that the, the vision of this revolution will, will be delivered in, in anything less than decades um, and that means it's not going to be the new revolutionized highway, but I think inescapably the amount of effort that's gone in to the research and development, there are going to be these spillover benefits that create some changes in our highway experience. So neither therefore is it a complete dead end. Okay, thank you. That's a good place. So thank you to finish. So uh, over to you, Amodjtaba, to, to wrap up. Uh, thank you again, everyone. It was a very fascinating, informative roundtable. Uh, we heard the thoughts, uh, both the, the positives, the highway side and the, end, uh, the dead end side. And uh, uh, sort of everybody agreed that there are benefits to automated vehicles, but we, we are far from fully automated vehicle if we are ever going to be there. And uh, there are other concerns as um, is really AV on top of the list? For mobility, environmental, and uh, societal problem, or is as uh, Glenn said, it's just uh, hype and pump and dump. And we also have uh, technological barriers, as uh, Louise mentioned. Uh, uh, two years ago, everybody thought that AI is the solution. That's it. They're going to even answer our philosophical uh, questions. But uh, we sort of seems to be waking up from that, and no. Uh, it doesn't seem to be. And uh, as uh, Ty um, said it beautifully, AVs are not infallible. Uh, we have to educate the public and we have to demand the industry to be responsible. It is easier for more startups without a lot of history to take that risk and put a cost on society, but we see a more responsible um, approach from uh, older and more established uh, factories. Um, and uh, Luis said that um, uh, we are testing the automated vehicles now, but should we? To hear the answer to that question, I invite you to come to our next roundtable, uh, which is on uh, uh, mobility and ethics. Do we have a say? That's the title. And I send the link to it. Uh, we have a few unconfirmed speakers, but uh, we'll send the confirmed speaker uh, by end of next week. And uh, follow us on Twitter. I also send a link to Twitter. And uh, thank you, everyone. It was a very, very um, informative and useful roundtable. Hope to be able to meet everybody and continue the conversation.